Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I'm your host, Alex Shevalenko, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Christian Velocios, co-founder and CEO of Katana. We, uh, Katana is taking on manufacturing ERP software, effectively taking on uh, what SAP has been doing for a few decades. Uh, and in addition, Christian has a history as an investor in his native Estonia. So it's a fascinating story to hear both an investor and entrepreneur taking on a huge and very important industry for us. Christian, welcome to the pod. Hi, Alex, and thank you for having me on the show. Amazing. Well, listen, first, let's start with the, the beginnings, Estonia. And I think there's some something there to the origin story. But uh, as I mentioned, I come from the former USSR. And, you know, some of my best friends were Estonians when I could have left the USSR. And, and so I got to know a little bit of the, the, the country and the mentality. So I, I probably understand why there's a sort of phenomenal rate of really entrepreneurial and innovative folks coming out of Estonia. But I don't mm -hmm. think it's a well understood phenomenon outside mm -hmm. of, you know, some European markets. I think, you know, people think of Israel, they get like, okay, startup nation. And Estonia is smaller, but it has kind of so many foundational startups and you're building the next one. So tell us, you know, from your position as an investor in startups, as an investor in one of the largest investors in Estonia in general, here's historically, what's going on? What are you guys eating over there? <laughs> I'm uh, happy, to, happy to share my view on this. Uh, yes, I mean, similarly to you, I was also born in the in the USSR in the, in the early 80s. But, you know, I think Estonia got independent when I was, well, let me do the math quickly, nine years old or somewhere around that. And so I don't remember much of that time, to be honest. And, and yeah, since then I have been living and working in Estonia. And of course, the country has gone through a... Uh, massive transformation compared to where we were in the beginning of 90s and where we are today. And it's a very small country. It's only one point, what, let's say one and a half million people living here. But we have the highest number of unicorns per capita in the world. And and some, and, you know, some <laughs> uh, I've heard some people saying that you know, Estonia wins everything per capita. There's not much <laughs> capita, right? <laughs> so, uh, but there is a story behind it. Uh, uh, I mean, and I think there are two main elements uh, of, uh, of of this success story. Uh, one of them is that uh, Estonia basically has no internal market. And you, if you think of, you know, um, if you think of um, um, startups that are born in, you know, let's take Germany or the US, uh, and you have you have a large home market that you can service. So very often these companies, you know, spend many years trying to establish the product market fit and trying to establish themselves on their on, on the on the market where they started. When it comes to Estonia, then you have to be global from day one. There is there is no local demand uh, typically for any of your products or services. And that forces founders to go global very early, which mm. was which was the case for with Katana as well. I mean, we from day one we, we we thought of Katana as a global company, and we we built up our go-to market globally. And today we have customers in eighty different countries. And uh, uh, so this 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 small home region forces founders and entrepreneurs to uh, to go to go global or to start exporting very very early. And then of course the second element here, also very important, if you if, when you think of Estonia success, is the the founding story of Skype. Mm. And it was although you know. Global, it's it's well known that the the founders of of, of Skype came from from Nordics. And then then the actually the, the tech team and, and the core of that uh, product uh, was developed in Estonia, and uh, and technical co-founders were from were Estonians, and and that you know Skype turned into a a, a big global success, and uh, and that that built laid the foundation for the for for many years to come because you know. It, it attracted it attracted talent and, and it, it schooled and, and and developed the local talent to a level where 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 many in many of the areas we we have people that are world class and then the spillover effect started because those employees those early employees of Skype started then founding companies which in later you know turned turned unicorns um, on their own and and if we if we think of the all the unicorns that we have in Estonia then you can basically track back from all of them to to the to the origins of Skype. 
either you know being employees at Skype or or either having pretty key team members in their team who were former employees of Skype. So so that that was the catalytic event that 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 set it all in motion. Yeah, that, that feels that feels right to an outsider. So a product that I use on a regular basis is Wise, right? And one of the or used to be called TransferWise. Yeah, and, and obviously founded by one of the early Skype folks. Precisely. Uh, and and then you know for again to connect the dots for some of our listeners, if you are if you are having trouble getting Uber in any one of the major European capitals, you know, then there's this wonderful company called Bolt that will get yeah. you there cheaper, faster. And, you know, I think what, what I admire is, and I think this is maybe back to your founding story as well, is that, you know, th- this is going global and like not being afraid to take on giants like Uber that frankly, quite a lot of, you know, very other ambitious teams and founders have, struggle to take on uber right like so we know we know story you know many countries have had their uber and then they they kind of went away you know because they just weren't able to compete so what do you what do you think is this this is this the global ambition is it the part that skype went on to be such a you know at the time a defining defining company for the era like you know not not just doing a small startup Right, but like going up and you know against very aggressive and well-established competitors. Yeah, it's uh, I guess it's the it's the mentality that you know with the with the right people and the and the right funding you and the right vision you're able, it is possible to achieve big things. It's the this this kind of an entrepreneurial thinking or spirit is very very much ingrained into 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 Estonians. And it's a good question to ask: Why is it so? I think the Kind of this this feeling of liberation and and that the, the world is world is your oyster type of an approach you know that, that developed into people's minds after 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 the USSR collapse, I guess kind of helped uh, to to uh, to 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 think big and and to really dream big, but I think the the other element that you touched upon here was that you know how come for example Point has been able to to compete against Uber while while many others have failed globally, it's also the um, the kind of the mindset of being super efficient. I mean, Point Point CEO Marcus has has commented on that on that many times that you know they are they are trying to run very very efficient operations uh, and 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 that efficiency and that kind of scrappiness that is built into the company's culture has allowed them to 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 take on those those giants and I think many founders from the region think like I agree. There's something when when you. And this may be like a, a Soviet era thing, or maybe just general lack of resources, where like mm-hmm. there is no, you know, not a ton of venture capital money dropped at you, you know, on day one. That you being one probably an exception to this rule. We'll come back to that, but but I think the there's sort of this um, DNA of you know survival is you know and just yeah. making do in a constrained resource environment, which was you know if you have a centrally planned economy. You almost never have anything that you need at the right time, so you kind of have to figure stuff out, and and it does seem like it's a secret sauce if you then transplant that DNA into into kind of other environments where there there may be some for some competitors it may be you know they they're too rich and that's also sort of the source of their demise or at least kind of economic inefficiencies. But on your end, you know, like back to back to Katana. You know, I worked. You know, as you know, my company that that I was part of from the early team days at Success Factors got acquired by SAP. It was obviously, mm-hmm. you know, an anchor company. I even remember before we got acquired, writing a ebook. You know, why working? You know, leveraging your SAP investment with our platform at Success Factors is the best thing ever. So people, we were going directly against SAP, right? We were competing. Mm-hmm. But we were we sort of found a you know a layer where we we're better, and then we we're trying to play coy, so to speak. And obviously, we were competing, and that's why we got acquired, and it was sort of a, a good thing for 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 the at that time. But I think you're you know maybe you're not going head on into the main area of strength, but you're taking on an industry that historically is perceived as complicated, cumbersome, limited to technical specialists that need to get trained for you know months into in terms of how to use you know various components of the ERP 
yeah. guide it and guide me a little bit. What drove you to to do that, and how are you going about you know disrupting the status quo in this space? Now, yeah, let me start by just very briefly introducing Katana. You know, to provide the the context for the for the listeners here. You know, Katana is a is a cloud inventory software for uh, for small and and medium sized businesses globally. And what we do is Katana, we, we're going to make sure that, that companies can efficiently and effortlessly store, order, use, make, and sell physical goods, everything related to physical goods. And so we, the software combines purchasing, manufacturing, order fulfillment, warehouse management, inventory management, and a very industry agnostic across a variety of industries from, you know, cosmetics, food and beverage, apparel, furniture, and so on and so forth. And the journey. For me personally, I mean, my, my background is, is, is investment banking. I started mm-hmm. my career in, 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 20s, in my 20s investment banking, then continued uh, in my 30s into what I, what I call my corporate career period and ended up uh, working as the CEO of, of one of the largest investment firms, the family offices here in, in, in Estonia. But the, but the story of Katana begins from another path that I've taken in life, which is angel investing. So for the past mm. decade, I've been an active angel investor in tech, here in, in Estonia and in the Baltics, but, but also investing in more mature businesses. And it was about eight years ago when I helped to co-found a um, direct-to-consumer manufacturing company. Mm. And, and we were looking, for, we were trying to find an ERP solution for such a modern manufacturer. And, and then, you know, look through the product offerings of, 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 of the names that you mentioned before and, 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 their comp- and, and, and its competitors. And so these traditional big complex, expensive business suites that, that, that to date dominate the, the, the ERP market, especially when we talk about kind of mid-market and enterprise. Yeah. And, and, and I was just, you know, I was just puzzled. How is it possible that it's, you know, it's one of the largest software verticals in the world. ERP is, is you know, considered by some 50 billion uh, US dollars annually, globally. And, uh, and how come the market leaders are so clunky, so expensive, so hard to implement, so hard to, and you know, you have these horror stories on the market of companies spending, you know, millions and or years in trying to implement those those complex ERP products. So I kind of felt that it must be possible uh, to to build something that is that is easy to use, or at least significantly easier to use. And, and when I say easy to use, and if you think about the kind of the wider customer experience here, then not just easy to use in terms of product features, but you know, easy to easy to onboard, easy to implement, easy to consume, easy to communicate with in, in all its aspects, yeah. right? Yeah. And, we have uh, a, we have a saying that we like, and I'll, I'll kind of because I, I, I love what you, your alliteration here. We have like easy to understand, easy to to try, easy to buy, easy to deploy. Yeah, and you know, exactly. like so something like that, right? Like so something yeah, that you yeah. want people to understand it, you know, do it, talk about it to their friends after you've been successful, right? And, yeah. and not some sort of forced case study in a conference where you know it's sort of contrived as it gets, you know, it's like, yeah, well, we worked for two years with our brilliant partners and we went yeah. live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, precisely. And internally here, we, we we kind of joked about it that like you know that let's take this easy to use and kind of put it on steroids. Yeah. Uh, and then and then and then use that concept in the in 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 the, in the vertical that is everything but easy to use. And this is precisely what the ERP software vertical is, right? Yeah. So uh, so some of the big questions, yeah. Uh, th- these were some of the big questions that we asked. And and uh, and during this mapping exercise, when trying to find a solution like that to this modern direct-to-consumer manufacturer, it became kind of evident for me that there is a market opportunity. It's going to be a tough journey because it's it's difficult to enter the ERP market. It's probably one of the most expensive products uh, to build because it's so feature-rich, right? Mm-hmm. But if you would start small and with a clear focus. And, and start moving up market step by step, then eventually we should reach a spot where we can start competing with the big ones, you know, SAPs and Oracle NetSuites of this world. Mm-hmm. And this is precisely the journey that we've, we've been on for the past seven years now with Katana. Mm-hmm. And, and, and yeah, so you could say that the, the uh, Katana was born out of personal frustration. Mm. So what's interesting in, in that founding story is also that you were an investor 
you know, investor turned founder, right? And the uh, the last big challenge to the ERP hegemony, so to speak, was Dave Duffield, who founded Workday. He's previously founded PeopleSoft. So he kind of like, and it was the friendlier version of, you know, HR centric ERP yeah. back in the days. And then he just went and went down the cloud route. And there were some user improvements, probably not like as massive, you know, because they 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 ultimately went after the enterprises. So what kind of gave you gave you personally the nudge that yeah, I can I can go and you know take on take on the giants here without having you know that depth of direct experience and building something that complex yourself. Yeah, I mean, firstly, you know, to be fully transparent here, there is if I would have known everything that I know today, <laughs> would I have taken on the journey? And I think that this is a question that many, many, many founders ask themselves. There is in every entrepreneur, there is a certain, there has to be a certain level of, I think the correct word is na- naivety. Like you, yeah. you have to be uh, to some extent naive because if you, if you would know all the struggles and all the obstacles, you, you would shy away, right? So, but but then again, what kind of gave me that confidence is that firstly. You know, my founding team, uh, my co-founders, having, you know, uh, my technical co-founder having uh, experience from uh, from the days of, of of Skype and Playtech and unicorns here we have in the region, so very strong kind of technical expertise that uh, that he was able to import, and my other co-founder very strong in in and having worked with companies that are implementing ERPs and their data uh, solutions and so on and so forth, and the fact that we went after the SMB market and we are still uh, uh, mm-hmm. date SMB product, we haven't moved into enterprise. So the um, we understood that if we go step by step and if we move up market step by step, starting with the smallest customer that is most underserviced, and then moving upward from there, we should be able to you know show traction along the way and attract enough capital that over the course of, of several years we reach a point where we break this this barrier of entry that these traditional ERP players have have built over the decades, mm-hmm. and we be able to amass enough capital. To build enough product to to start to get access to 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 some of the larger businesses step by step, and this is exactly what we have done. So it is a huge elephant, but you know, as the saying goes, you know, chop it into smaller pieces and and mm. eat, eat, eat it piece by piece, and and that's that has been very much the motto uh, and 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 the uh, the, uh, the way that we have we have approached this journey. And so, so it sounds like by picking on direct to consumer manufacturer, which was at the time probably one of the hotter categories, you kind of identified that yes, great new growing market. By definition, they are smaller, and you know, or, or mm-hmm. gonna, if they were being bought maybe by somebody, but they maybe remained independent and so on. So that sounds great. Now the market is a little bit not as in vogue, at least from investor enthusiasm. You, you know the. What does that mean for you as somebody serving that market? Or is that kind of, do you seeing implications of that, right? Like a lot of people here had like, well, you have the SaaS recession. You yeah. kind of had, may have, <laughs> was there a D2C recession? And how did you handle that after you've already t- taken off on your, and yeah. you, was your product? Great question. And uh, you're absolutely correct that, you know, in the early days when we launched, I think we went live with our prototype back in 2008, Mm -hmm. spring 2008. And in the early days, we were focused on direct-to-consumer manufacturers and the kind Mm -hmm. of the lower end of the market, the smaller one, the smaller guys, you know, small, larger workshops, smaller factories, maybe only, you know, 10 to 50 member teams. And, 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 yeah, during that time, you know, we, this, this was a, booming industry and then COVID hit and, you know, we, there was another layer of boost from that for, for direct-to-consumer. But at the same time, as we moved up market, we were building out the product for a direct-to-consumer manufacturer. Then we realized that it's one of the most kind of complex business models to have because it entails, direct-to-consumer manufacturers entails traditional manufacturing, e-commerce retail. And as those businesses scale, they typically also started selling B2B. So it's also the mm. element of distribution and, and resale, right? Mm. So while we were building a product for direct-to-consumer manufacturer, we noticed that we are becoming a better, better fit for pure traditional manufacturers or B two B B two B businesses or or you know pure uh, retailers or pure uh, distributors, and and the and the customer segment started widening and and the uh, and the differentiation started to increase. So today. A big part of Katana's customers are still manufacturers and big part of Katana's customers have a direct-to-consumer element. But 
most of Kaktana businesses today are what we call kind of hybrid business models. The, the lines between manufacturing, retail, e-commerce retail, it's, it's getting blurry. And so many of our customers don't identify themselves anymore as direct-to-consumer or, or manufacturer or, or distributor. They rather say, you know, we are a cosmetics brand or we are a furniture brand. Yeah. Or we, we, we make right. electric bikes. So, uh, so over the years, the, the business models that we service have widened. We moved beyond manufacturing, but we, we still are operating very much in the space of physical goods. Got it. And, and when you deal with somebody that is more consumer centric, right? They mm-hmm. really have a perception of themselves as, you know, we're, you know, first and foremost, we're a brand and then yeah. we're like something else. We found that that's kind of a very interesting area where experiences and communications, like it, to those companies, the expectations are higher sure. than some other more conventional B2B areas, which are you know not historically you know as brand centric. And part of it could be that the leaders in that business come from brand background and are like big brand believers and they've been trained and they have higher expectations. So to sell to them, you need to be more like them and part of it is just there's just more trained eye right like there's just a trained eye for like you know hey I, i'm paying attention to this i noticed that you know in, in running my own startup like i think i'm a lot more dangerous it was my expectations now than when i was starting out kind of like wanting to be dangerous but i wasn't as much mm-hmm. so what are you seeing right because you have this broad range from probably pretty traditional manufacturers that are kind of more much of a focused on the manufacturing and, you know, Six Sigma excellence. And then there is yeah. like the brand <laughs> opposite of that. And sometimes it's one and the same, but what are you seeing and how's that influencing how you go to market? Um, you're absolutely correct. But I would even say that very often today, it's it's kind of one and the same that we, we are servicing brands who have those high expectations. And, and of course, many of them also have in-house manufacturing operations, at mm. least to some extent. Some, of course, outsource, but there is an element of, of in-house manufacturing or at least some fa- form of final assembly. Uh, and, 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 and yes, they, they identify as, as brands, and, uh, which means that there is a certain level of expectations towards us as well. As they are customer-centric, then you know, the value that, um, in the end, our customers want and, and need to deliver is that they ship right products at the right time in right quantities to the right customer. Now uh, and 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 when those companies are customer centric, that means that you know there is very little room for error for us to make sure that they can deliver on the promise. We mm. are the system of records. We are the system of records, and we are their main business software, uh, and they rely on us to deliver on that promise. Uh, I mean, you could argue that maybe more traditional manufacturing businesses or, or, or traditional resellers or distributors that there is. There was more has been, or, or maybe to date is a bit more legroom for, for mistakes. But, but definitely with those modern brands, the expectations are high, which has pushed us as a company to, to really deliver beyond what was traditionally what was traditionally expected from, a, from an ERP. You could even say that you know, traditionally ERPs, customers expect the ERPs to be a bit clunky or, or kind of uh, expect the ERPs to be a bit clunky or difficult to use. But but you know we we have we have we are working today with brands that, that don't have that expectation and we need to respond to that which means that you know we have to not just be able to deliver on that promise in the product but everything beyond that as well the way we communicate with the customers we have turned our customer support into a competitive advantage and our customer success mm. into a competitive advantage for us we've over invested in that you could even say mm. to make sure that you know we are there for them. Because, you know, ERP, traditional ERPs are notoriously bad when it comes to support and success and customer communications. So this is just, you know, this is just one example. You know, but the other one I could say is that you know, we put a lot of effort in making sure that we have proper product design, you know, included in, in whatever we build. So we wouldn't end up with, you know, spreadsheet in the browser with 1,000 buttons, but the user needs 10, right? right. So, right. so just, you know, so these examples are from the product, but also kind of beyond the way you consume, where you onboard, what is the experience there? So we try to think kind of beyond the traditional of, you know, we just build ERP software, but rather we build a company that needs to be able to deliver the software that, that, that delivers the, uh, the uh, promise to our customers, but also everything around it, the services, the way we communicate, 
everything beyond that needs to also uh, deliver that promise. So we don't see Katana merely as a, as a as a software company. We we see that you know we are we build uh, we build a lot of the software that makes these business processes effortless. But in the end, we want to enable growth for for those entrepreneurs. And so we also so how, teach them and guide them. So so this is fascinating. So this feels great when I know you, right? And I work with you and maybe, maybe I hear a customer that's already worked with you. But for most people, they discover you somehow, either it's through outbound, you know, you reaching yeah. out, especially when we were before you, you had the brand team and kind of credibil- bigger credibility in the market. So how do you get that across? Like what's been your... Um, you know, is it is it founder led sales at the beginning that that mm-hmm. was kind of driving this? Do you have a large team? How how do you design this team? Right, because we talked about originally, the the software maybe is in Estonia, yeah. but like the sales, are you also centralizing that? You know, I'd be very curious to see how do you bring to market a new yeah. category, at least for SME, new category defining uh, brand. Yeah, I, I'll take a, a quick deep dive into the go to market motion. So. Um, as we started, when we started, we, we obviously were very much inbound marketing driven, demand capture mainly. And, and of course, at some point, at some point during the revolution, the kind of demand generation layer uh, was added on top of it. But where we have our big bet today is, is in tech partnerships and channel partnerships. Mm. Uh, and, and why is that? It's because compared to traditional business suites, uh, like you know, Oracle NetSuite or SAP, they are checks of all trade, master of none. In that sense, that they build all the modules that the customer requires themselves, and I so see. they have their own CRM, they have their own accounting, they have their own shipping. While we at Katana are focused on inventory management and deliver our software on, on, on in that field, but when it comes to accounting, we integrate with QuickBooks Online and Zero, the best mm-hmm. SMB accounting platforms out there, right? When it comes to when it comes to e-commerce storefront, there's Shopify. You know, there's when it when it comes to CRMs, when it comes to shipping, you know, we, we integrate with best in class. As a result, you know, the tech stack that the customer has is, is, is best of breed and the best tool for the job, right? Now, and as a result, we are very active in the in the tech and channel partnership and ecosystems of our key partners. So we, we collaborate a lot with QuickBooks Online. We collaborate mm-hmm. with Shopify and 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 to make sure that, that, that as, as they also move up market, that we can deliver that experience to those customers who have those advanced inventory needs and who look to build a tech stack of best of breed products instead of going down the business suite route, which kind of has this major vendor lock for them for years to come. So it's it's so to sum up, it's inbound marketing and 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 on top of that, you know, tech and channel partnership play with the likes of QuickBooks Online and Shopify. So let's let's dive in. So let's start with the inbound. So what does that mean? You know, when you're you're going against kind of it sounds like demand capture, you know, heavily. Yeah. So so it sounds like it's a mature category, but I you know, I'm curious how many people look up inventory management type of like a very like is this is this sort of just feeding you like the like because it's a pretty deliberate thing that people are looking for or are you going around in adjacent like and seeing adjacent areas for opportunities to, to capture that demand? Yeah, I mean, the, the honest answer here is it's both. I mean, in, in mm-hmm. the early days, it was very much uh, demand capture and, and SEO work uh, that we did at Katana and, and invested quite a lot in it to capture to capture exactly the, the people that are out there looking for you know, manufacturing ERP or, or inventory management software or you know Shopify manufacturing or, or QuickBooks inventory and, and, and elements like that. But then, of course, over time, you know, more of the kind of content play and demand generation you know, ebooks and 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 all sorts of materials for to 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 attract the the audience that might not necessarily be purchasing at this point in time, but then to try to turn them into 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 leads uh, over a longer period of time. So uh, so it's both, and it's and, and, and it, that's that that's how we have developed uh, over the years. But I guess it's very similar to many other SaaS products that are are selling to the SMB space in that sense. And are you finding that you're starting to replace other solutions at this point, or are you still capturing new unmet demand where where you know you, you're you're probably not competing with something best in class, you know, like a bunch of spreadsheets or whatever, whatever is the basic the basic rudimentary workarounds for what you're yeah. building? Great question. Um, it's funny. I mean, I, when when 
as as an investor and as someone who has co-founded you know, businesses that that sell physical products, many companies. I mean, they they initially start with building building some form of a spreadsheets based you know structure to 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 run the early days of the operations. And I've been just amazed how big of a business people have built on spreadsheets, and and then of course how big of a mess. They can they can get themselves into uh, you know trying to continue scaling it. Um, I, I thought in the early days that you know very quickly we would be into replacing only and you know spreadsheets has its limits, but still to date I find leads in our funnel that that are you know crying out for help because they've been delaying that purchasing decision of a of a proper inventory management or a proper ERP tech stack yeah. and have scaled to tens of millions in revenue. And they still have a big part of the business running on spreadsheets. And those are out of sync. And you know, everybody has their own version of it. And there's there's not a single point of truth in the business. Everyone yeah. has their own understanding what's the inventory level of this and that. Yeah. And 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 of course, you know, doing that transformation too late is is it becomes a it becomes a challenge for the company. Uh, so the earlier the better, of course. You set yourself up for success if you if you invest in that early days. So, so you mentioned you kind of brought back your investor hat. So let's let's kind of come back to that a little bit. Sure. So you know you've raised I think like a thirty six. And we we've raised in total fifty, but the latest round Series B was was thirty six. Yes. Thirty six, right? Total yeah. of fifty. Great investors, kind of the the same folks that backed Spotify and the Atomico folks, kind of were the ones behind Skype yeah. originally, as 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 well known. So, but but the interesting thing is, you were here, a former investor, raising from from those folks. What did you bring into those investor conversations that you think other founders would benefit from that have not, you know, worn the investor shoes and founder shoes before? Like, because mm-hmm. you really had a pretty unfair advantage, I would say, at least in that component of building the business. Well, well, it's 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 a great question because you see, to some ways you could say that it's an advantage. To some ways you could say it's a disadvantage, and I'll let okay. me explain. Obviously, there is an advantage when it comes to fundraising. You have when you are, you know, worked in investment banking in the past. You know how to build your presentations. You know how to build your financial models, right? And uh, and having been an investor. You you know you you understand the psychology game of of, of the bodies the, on both sides of the table, but it was also you know for me personally I mean I also had to prove that I'm an entrepreneur at heart, and mm. I want to solve that this customer problem, and I'm not an investment banker or former investment banker or a former former angel investor that you know knows how to how to build a model or do a nice right. pitch deck right, so so in the early days it's I think it was both an advantage and a disadvantage I guess I came in well prepared. Mm. But I also had to had to had to show that I, I I have this personal relation and passion to the problem at hand, and I really want to you know put myself into the customer's shoes, understand their perspective, and then and then then you know build the product that and build a service around it that that solves that core problem. So so yeah, I think it was both. Okay, what would you do differently if you if you had to raise again? If, or if you had to build a business again, you're starting from scratch. You've you've had a few lessons. New market environment. AI is around. What, 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 um, what, well, the what situation would, yeah. is different. I mean, yeah. today the, the market is different. AI is around, obviously, and that that also plays a big role when it comes to our roadmap uh, in Katana for the for the coming years, as it I guess does for everyone, right? What I would do differently, of course, there has been decisions along the way. Uh, you know, in hindsight. You would say that you know some of the decisions should have been taking uh, taken earlier, and and some uh, and I should have been more decisive here and there. Uh, uh, but the uh, uh, but I would take on that journey again, hundred percent. I mean the 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 pleasure that I get from working uh, with those customers. We are in the SMB space. Very often we talk to the founders and CEOs directly that mm-hmm. are building these super cool businesses, super cool products. So when, when people come to me and ask for, for advice, if they're you know, starting entrepreneurs, I often tell them that, look, there are many ways in this world how to make money. And you may stumble on opportunities from time to time, you know, that, that look very lucrative from financial perspective. You know, if I would do this, there's likelihood I would succeed financially. But you have to ask yourself, do you, are you passionate about it? Do you really mm. want to solve this problem? Because 
the entrepreneurial journey, it gets tough along the way, right? At some point, at least. And you have to have that resilience and grit to continue. And if you don't have, if you can't relate to the customer, you can't relate to the problem personally, you don't have the passion for it, you're doing it for the wrong reasons, for the financial gain only, mm. then you, it's very difficult to, 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 uh, to maintain that uh, required level of resilience, in my, in my opinion. So, so even if you're Estonian, even different. if you're Estonian, even if you're still, Estonian, yeah. if you yeah. still need to have the passion for for well, the well, I, mission I, and the customer, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll, I'll 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 give a side comment from my personal life. I mean, I'm a uh, I really love surfing, very surfing, and I mean, I'm not really good at it, but I love it, and I, I think of it exactly as a as a as a sport that is really you know that suits very well for a founder or for an Estonian both. That you know, you, you have to you spend you know fifty nine minutes of from of an hour in water paddling and fighting the waves, and then you potentially you get sixty seconds of 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 riding the riding the wave, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's there's a lot of you know grit and and hard work that needs to be done to to get the to get the reward, and and I think that you know helps to helps to build that that mental resilience that is required. Mm. And, and this actually leads me to 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 my last question. Uh, about how you're approaching building your team. I, I think we we, this, we did a little check on LinkedIn. You're you're attracting people from some of those unicorns, great companies that have been successful. What is it that you're doing to, you know, a attract you know great folks to join you, right? In a, in a market where I think it, it matters, right? If you're in Estonia and it's a you know re relatively limited population you know, that's, that's valuable. And then what are you doing to build a culture, you know, that will set you up to take on, you know, other, you know, SAP, whatever you say about it, it has its culture. It's very, sure. you know, you know, and technically driven, yeah, and a strong mm -hmm. one. And it has been a source of strength, um, you know, Salesforce, uh, you know, great culture, more and more around the customers, right? So a lot of these sort of venerable ERP, you know, and enterprise software uh, solutions have had a very strong culture. I would love to hear how you're thinking about it in the mm -hmm. long term and what are you, who you're attracting right now. Yeah, happy to comment on this. Now, firstly, yes, you're correct. I mean, we started the, the company in Estonia and the, the product development is still here. And there's a lot of, you know, good engineering talent available here in the region, thanks to Skype and the spillover effect that followed. But by now, considering the most of our customers are in North America. We're very much US and Canada focused. Then most of our customer facing teams are also based mm -hmm. there. So it's it's a very global. And in addition to that, we also sell to Australia, New Zealand, and UK. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. due to that, it's it's a very global talent pool. Now, in terms of culture, what we have built to attract the talent, I think most importantly, we we have tried to build a company that is that has is very transparent, you know, internally as well as externally. And, and and what advantage that we have here, you know, compared to the big ones that we are competing with, is that we've been able to create, uh, thanks to the startup structure and logic, this you know, feeling of ownership. And obviously, all the all the Katana team members are our shareholders uh, in Katana, and and we are very transparent about the good things and the bad things. So all the team members know what are the targets and what is the challenge that we're up against. You know, for it comes to the next 12, 18 months, 18 months milestones that we need to reach. We talk very openly about the things that are going well, but we also talk very openly about the things that are not going well, because that's the only way for us to improve, right? Mm -hmm. So there's very little sugarcoating, very little, quite a direct culture, but directness together with that, but meaning that we, we, I mean, Estonians in general don't really do a lot of small talk. We get straight to mm -hmm. the point. And mm -hmm. I think this is, this, this is part that's become part of our culture as well. Uh, and we, we attack those problems together and, and we don't, you know, uh, try to brush things under the carpet that are perhaps not, not moving as well as they should. So, and a lot of, I try to give my team a lot of ownership, I mean, together with responsibility over those areas. So I, I've tried to employ a team that, that takes full ownership over their respective domains and I've given them this freedom to operate. But then, of course, try to hold them accountable when when it comes to the the, the targets we need to reach and the milestones, um, uh, and and not to compromise on the on the values that we've defined for Katana along that way. So uh, this environment of of, of transparency and, and and ability to execute and freedom to operate has allowed us to to attract talent globally. But of course, being a, for a company coming from Estonia. We, 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 it's a constant challenge to, 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 to get that talent from the international markets and then something we need to continue investing on, investing into. Sorry. Well, we are rooting for you, Christian, super inspired by your story, Katana's story, Estonia's story where can people 
that want to follow up and learn more about what you guys are up to can find you and the company? I mean, yeah, firstly, yeah, thanks. Thanks for all the listeners here. And thank you, Alex, for, for having me. If you want to learn more about Katana, open your Google and type in Katana Inventory Management and you'll, you'll find it straight away. You know, follow me on LinkedIn and, and looking forward to, to looking forward to, to seeing you exploring, exploring the product and the service offering that we have. And I have to say it was a real pleasure being on the show, Alex, and talking uh, with you here today. Perfect. Thank you.